July 7, 2005, four explosions rocked the London subway and tore open a packed double-decker bus during the morning rush hour. More than 50 people were killed and 700 more were wounded. It was the worst attack on the city since World War II. British authorities have identified four suspected suicide bombers who carried out the attacks. The four men, all British citizens, allegedly used backpacks to transport the bombs. A fifth man, an Egyptian biochemist, has also been arrested in connection with the bombing. Officials believe the bombings have all the trademarks of Al-Qaeda. They were timed to strike during a major political event, and they were well coordinated. All four of the explosions occurred within one hour. For your own safety, walk away now. The chaotic scene in London was eerily reminiscent of the strikes on Madrid, Bali, Washington, and New York City. The most recent attack has renewed America's commitment to continue its worldwide campaign to destroy Al-Qaeda. Today, Al-Qaeda's top two leaders, Osama bin Laden, and his deputy, Ayman al-Zawahiri, remain at large. In addition, the U.S. now faces a new and potentially more deadly enemy. Terrorist cells in at least 80 countries willing to strike at the first opportunity. Even though we routed the Taliban and Al-Qaeda, uh, it's like cancer and the cancer is spreading. The United States was stunned when hijacked planes crashed into the World Trade Center towers in New York and the Pentagon outside Washington, killing nearly 3,000 people on September 11, 2001. American officials immediately suspected Osama bin Laden and his Al-Qaeda organization. Based in Afghanistan, they were protected by the Taliban, a fundamentalist Islamic regime. They had, in fact, hijacked and bought a country. We now know that Al-Qaeda rented Afghanistan from the Taliban for $20 million a year. Bin Laden and his most loyal followers were preparing for jihad, or holy war, in dozens of training camps there. The numbers and the estimates vary anywhere from 20,000 to 50,000 students uh, over a 10-year period. This is essentially the academy where standard operating procedures for guerrilla warfare, for terrorist uh, action, for bomb making, um, also information about what the vulnerabilities were in Western society. Although U.S. officials knew about these camps and the threat from Al-Qaeda, stopping them proved more difficult. After September 11th, the United States understood that the attack by Al-Qaeda amounted to a declaration of war. By the beginning of October, the U.S. responded by parachuting special operations forces into Afghanistan to work with the Northern Alliance, a local militia dedicated to defeating the Taliban. Special forces pinpointed enemy troop locations with handheld lasers and called in Air Force bombers to demolish them. With that kind of help, the Northern Alliance took Kabul, the capital of Afghanistan, after less than a month of fighting. Essentially, the Al-Qaeda and Taliban were destroyed as a force in Afghanistan with fewer than 300 Americans on the ground. But finding Al-Qaeda's top leaders in the wreckage of Afghanistan proved to be much more difficult. The intelligence in any operation is only as good as the last thing that you heard or you saw. When we inject our presence, when we start to attack, everything that we knew, everything that we understood as far as the location and the operations of the enemy changes instantly. Now they're in hiding, now they're moving to places we didn't know they had, such as caves and tunnels. By talking to tribesmen on the ground, Special Forces troops learned Al-Qaeda's leaders were on the move. They listened in on phone and radio communications to pinpoint the terrorists' locations. 
The U.S. scored an important early success in November when a CIA predator drone spied dozens of Al-Qaeda operatives meeting at a hotel outside Kabul. The drone used a laser pointed to fix the target and F-15s dropped laser-guided bombs. One of the men killed was a member of bin Laden's inner circle. The most important person killed in Afghanistan was probably Mohammed Atif whose daughter was married to uh, Osama bin Laden's son, who was an Egyptian policeman, who was the head of the head of his military operations. But most of al-Qaeda's other known leaders escaped the U.S.'s grasp. From intelligence reports and spy planes, the U.S. knew that many of them had been in the city of Jalalabad, a Taliban stronghold, and had begun working their way toward the mountainous border region with Pakistan called Tora Bora. There, the U.S. tried the same strategy it had used against the Taliban. What the United States did, it used some special forces, not too many regular ground forces, but Afghan forces, and had them try and go against the Al-Qaeda leadership. The U.S. then sent in ground forces that it now turns out may have been the wrong choice for the job, the Army's 10th Mountain Division. There are reports that the 10th Mountain Division were not as fit and as well trained as they might have been. Interestingly, the best cold weather fighting force in the world is the U.S. Marine Corps. The 10th Mountain Division, however, had not trained at those altitudes, and I think some of their tactics were questionable because instead of seizing the high ground, which is the centerpiece of mountain warfare, they really took the middle ground and attacked upwards. At the price of several hundred casualties, Al-Qaeda forces fought back fiercely for two weeks delaying U.S. troops and their Afghan allies. A lot of the Taliban and Al-Qaeda got away, probably including Osama bin Laden. They escaped through underground tunnels, apparently. You're dealing in, in areas that are very difficult with lots of holes, lots of high, at great altitude in mountain conditions. So it's not surprising in my judgment that they escaped. Still, there were some important victories in Afghanistan. After six months of fighting, Approximately 4,000 Taliban and Al-Qaeda fighters were killed, and 7,000 were arrested. In addition, the U.S. destroyed Al-Qaeda's network of training camps. You can't underestimate the importance of having a geographic base. Even a wretched one like Afghanistan. These camps were important. The fact that people cannot go and train in Afghanistan is of tremendous importance. But in the end, the goals of the campaign were not met. If the purpose of going into Tora Bora was to capture or kill Osama bin Laden and the leadership of Al-Qaeda, we without question failed. In 2002, the U.S. military reduced its emphasis on Afghanistan as it shifted focus to its next target, the Iraqi dictator, Saddam Hussein. But the war against Al-Qaeda continued. Coming up, intelligence agencies launch a worldwide hunt for Al-Qaeda's leadership. Al-Qaeda, the goal of law enforcement was identifying and taking down as many cells around the world as they could. Their work began immediately after the 9-11 attacks, tracing the network of cells and supporters who made the attacks possible. There are people that would have been making sure that these support cells and these direct action cells, the men that were on the planes, that they were selected, trained, that they were um, completely aware of what their um, their requirements were once they were inside the United States in evading uh, capture, evading detection, and that the uh, support cells were all being uh, funded and equipped and manned appropriately. The trail quickly led to Europe. Three of the pilots had lived in Hamburg, Germany. Officials there immediately began tracking down other men who had lived and worked with them. The trail spread to Spain and beyond. The Madrid cell, which was Al-Qaeda to its core, financed the Hamburg cell, conducted pre-operational surveillance of the World Trade Centers in 1999. Armed with that information, the CIA's counter-terrorism center quickly developed a strategic plan called the Worldwide Attack Matrix to go after Al-Qaeda cells in 80 countries. They captured many terrorists with the help of some allies the U.S. had never worked with before. 
We have close working relationships today on some things with Saudi Arabia, which is one of the world's most uh, repressive uh, regimes, with Pakistan, uh, which uh, certainly exhibits uh, in parts of its bureaucracy uh, some support for terrorists. We can't take your average Americans, put them in black ninja suits and drop them into places and, and pull these operations off. It's a hugely complex liaison activity where you're working with the intelligence services of countries that know how to do this. By interrogating prisoners and searching their hideouts in Afghanistan and elsewhere, authorities found information that netted them bigger and bigger fish. Their first major catch was Abu Zubaydah, who had replaced Mohammed Atef as Al-Qaeda's military chief. He was captured in Pakistan in March 2002. Then came Ramzi bin al -Shib, who kept the money flowing to the hijackers and helped the pilots communicate with Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, who planned the attacks. Authorities matched a recording of bin al -Shib's voice with a recording snatched from a satellite listening post of a phone call he placed from Karachi. He was arrested there after a shootout, a year to the day after the 9-11 attacks. Every capture, every detention is unbelievably critical. It's exponential. Every time we capture an additional operative and go through that person's cell phone memory, documents, hard drive, uh, date book and interrogate that individual, we get a new treasure trove of information. One lead helped them nab Abd al-Rahim al-Nashiri, who ran al-Qaeda's operation on the Arabian Peninsula and planned the bombing of the USS Cole. In November 2002, he called one of the Cole bombers, Qaed al-Hareti, and the CIA traced the call to a car traveling in Yemen. A Predator drone armed with a Hellfire guided missile took out the car, killing Hareti and five other men. Despite the arrests and killings, Al-Qaeda operatives kept up their campaign of terror. An Al-Qaeda member bombed the synagogue in Tunisia on April 11, 2002, killing 21 people. Before striking, the bomber called his cell leader, who in turn called his boss in Pakistan to confirm the attack. Authorities tried to trace the call and found that terrorists had used an anonymous Swiss phone network card called a SIM card. You buy the SIM card that goes into your cell phone and you prepay for it then you can use it and that doesn't, no one can realize that it's your phone. Swiss authorities though had figured out a way to trace the cards. It led them to the boss in Pakistan who was none other than Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, the mastermind of the 9-11 attack. Mohammed knew he needed to change his cell phone to avoid detection but he didn't realize that tracing had become so sophisticated that authorities could now trace phone cards too. They eventually narrowed down his location in Pakistan. Authorities were on Khalid Sheikh's track for some time. The SIM cards narrowed down the search to the point of being able to capture him. In March 2003, Pakistani police made the arrest. I think Khalid Sheikh Mohammed was extremely important, not just because he may have been the mastermind behind the 9-11 uh, bombings, he, he most probably was also involved in the murder of Daniel Pearl in Karachi in February 2002. No detention, no capture, no success in the war on terrorism has been as critical as the capture of Khalid Sheikh Mohammed. In terms of stopping ongoing operations, in terms of capturing people whose knowledge cross-cuts the networks and the financing and knows who went through the camps, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed is the key individual. Almost immediately, he led them to even more information. He had computers, an address book, and more cell phones, which gave authorities a trove of 6,000 phone numbers. Indonesian officials used the numbers to arrest several members of a cell in Jakarta. Then, after a bombing at a residential complex in Riyadh in May 2003, Saudi authorities used Mohammed's phone records to find two active cells there. 
Other captured Al-Qaeda members also provided valuable information. Some of these uh, men uh, have, uh, have talked, a uh, number of not, but some have, and they've helped us uh, thwart other uh, terrorist attacks that way. There was allegedly a plot to blow up the U.S. Embassy in Paris that was foiled. European police found uh, an Egyptian restaurant in Brussels uh, stocked with, uh, with explosives uh, and uh, made some arrests in that regard. Uh, so there have been a number of successes. It was estimated that by the end of 2003, more than 3,000 operatives from 100 countries had been killed or captured as a result of the war in Afghanistan and the ongoing investigations around the world. Pakistan, where many operatives escape from Afghanistan, has been especially helpful, capturing almost 500 suspected Al-Qaeda members. We and our allies, for the most part, the Pakistanis, have taken that leadership down notch by notch. And so there's a few left, and I don't think they're effectively leading the world movement. But because of the way Al-Qaeda is set up, just capturing the leaders may not shut down the kind of terrorism it represents. These are still the old guard. These are essentially the generals. Um, in any military structure, and most junior officers and enlisted men will tell you that the fighting's done from about lieutenant colonel on down. So killing all the generals and getting all the generals and throwing them in jail, that's great. And it looks good, makes good press. But if all the colonels and all the sergeant majors and all the other lieutenants are still sitting out there fully trained and ready to fight, somebody's going to step up. Up next, the hunt for Al-Qaeda's lieutenants leads the U.S. authorities into their own backyard. Al-Qaeda terror network, both abroad and here at home. One of its top priorities in the U.S. was to look for sleeper cells. In addition, the U.S. also went after the lifeblood of Al-Qaeda, its money. Without money, there's no terrorism. The bottom line, you want to stop terrorism, you stop the finances, that's going to be very, that's going to play a very important role in stopping terrorism. The U.S. launched an aggressive campaign to shut down every means of financing available to Al-Qaeda terrorists in the United States and overseas. No potential money laundering operation would be overlooked. There's a myth that terrorism is cheap, but to provide your operatives day jobs, to buy their plane tickets, to get them a car rental, to do all the things that it takes any company money to do is extremely expensive. In October 2001, Congress passed the Patriot Act, which gave sweeping new powers to groups charged with thwarting terrorism. Law enforcement agencies were now required to share information with banks about suspicious individuals, and financial institutions were ordered to report to authorities any accounts, domestic and foreign, that might have a dirty money connection to terrorist activities. The FBI in particular has developed relationships with the private sector and brought in their terror financing experts and created a terrorist financing operations section. And it's been tremendously successful. The Department of the Treasury froze over $100 million belonging to individuals and organizations suspected of terrorist activities, including many Islamic charities. There are charities that were established from the get-go to serve as fronts for terrorist organizations. There are charities that were infiltrated by individuals and defrauded. The crackdown on charity fronts was global and extended to some of the most notorious money laundering operations in the Persian Gulf region. We are trying to get access to Saudi funding and Saudi financing. So that, the big money, if you will, it's possible that the big sources of money have been dried up. In addition, Places of worship long thought to be centers of terrorist activity became part of the government's investigation. The Al Farouk Mosque in Brooklyn, New York had been under surveillance by federal agents even before 9-11 because it was believed to be funding a Palestinian terrorist organization. Sheikh Ali Hassan al muyad a Yemeni cleric, was thought to be behind the operation at the mosque. Just like it's easy to use charities, it's easy to use the mask for a cover where you'll find few bad elements inside the mask, using it for their own uh, activities where m usually most of the members of the mask are not aware of this activity. 
In 2003, after a year-long undercover operation, U.S. agents arrested Sheikh Boyad and charged him with financing terrorism. He remains in federal custody. He claimed in court papers that he had collected some $20 million for Osama bin Laden and Al-Qaeda while associated with the Brooklyn Mosque. It actually played a role after 9-11, which is just unbelievable. You know, these people live with us. This mask is in the middle of New York City, and people still continue doing that. New York wasn't the only target for Al-Qaeda's financiers. There was a huge and deeply entrenched network of terrorist fundraisers laundering money in Northern Virginia. Really sophisticated laundering of tremendous amounts of money, not only for Al-Qaeda, but for Hamas, Palestinian Islamic Jihad, and other groups. A probe by the FBI and the Office of Homeland Security went on for more than a year. At the center of this investigation was Abdur Rahman Alamudi, a prominent Muslim-American activist and significant fundraiser for Islamic foundations and charities. He had been a guest of Presidents Clinton and Bush at the White House. But it was also believed that he was funneling millions of dollars to Al-Qaeda and other terrorist fronts through some of the foundations and charities he was involved with. Finally, in 2003, Federal agents arrested Alamudi and charged him with illegally accepting money from Libya for transfer to a Syrian terrorist group. I see that his arrest was very important and, and I, I feel like the Muslim community maybe was angry to see that he had two faces, but at least we were able to, to uncover that. Exposing and cutting off financial lifelines was only part of the all-out effort to hunt down Al-Qaeda in the United States. Across the U.S., law enforcement authorities were on the lookout for any hint of terrorist cells. In December 2001, local police in Portland, Oregon stumbled by chance on a small terrorist cell carrying on target practice in a rock quarry. Police discovered that the group of seven radicals Six of them American citizens had already made one failed attempt to get into Afghanistan to fight for Al-Qaeda and were about to try again. Oregon cell is very significant because the people there were actually recruited post 9-11. And also Americans, most of them are not even Arabic speakers. And they were recruited to fight for Al-Qaeda and they went to fight with Al-Qaeda and they were stopped. After their arrest by Portland police, two of the seven members of the cell, Patrice Ford and Jeffrey Battle, pleaded guilty to conspiracy to levy war against the United States and agreed to serve 18 years in a federal prison. Four other members of the group received lesser sentences. The cell was effectively put out of business. Every cell, every plot, whether it's an operational plot or a financial logistical support plot, that we foil is a huge success. And those that we foil here in the United States, as you can imagine, are particularly successful as far as we're concerned. But another big case involving a suspected terrorist cell in New York State left prosecutors with a lot of unanswered questions. In the spring of 2001, seven young men from a quiet Yemeni neighborhood in Lackawanna, New York, heard a charismatic recruiter for Al-Qaeda speak at their mosque. the Lackawanna men decided to go on a spiritual journey to Pakistan. But the trip also included a visit to one of bin Laden's training camps in Afghanistan. That is really a perfect example of how the Islamic Center recruited them. The men from Lackawanna received military training in the camp. Some actually had meetings with bin Laden. After they got home, they lied about their trip to Afghanistan when questioned by the FBI. Eventually, they confessed that they had gone to Afghanistan. And in the atmosphere following 9-11, six of the men, American citizens, were arrested. A cell, call it what you want. You know, I look at it, it's a criminal enterprise, and we didn't see any potential acts. But what we're concerned about, especially after 9-11, we want to make sure that we don't give somebody that has that potential the opportunity to do something. Though the government never presented any evidence that the Lackawanna men were planning terrorist activities, the six pleaded guilty to lending support 
to a terrorist organization. They are now serving seven to ten year prison terms. The case sent a message that associating with Al-Qaeda is not acceptable. It also increased awareness that Al-Qaeda could be lurking in our own backyard. It's clear that there are people in this country that uh, have links to Al-Qaeda in some shape or form. The FBI and Homeland Security has done an excellent job uh, keeping tabs on some of these people, making it infinitely harder to plan and carry out an attack here in the U.S. Does that mean that we're, uh, you know, that we're immune? Certainly not. Federal law enforcement officials say it's impossible to know how many individuals connected to Al-Qaeda may be living in the United States. It's one reason the country remains on constant low-level alert in order to respond quickly to any sign of domestic Al-Qaeda activity. Coming up, a high-energy search continues for Osama bin Laden, the leader of Al-Qaeda and the architect of its message of terrorism. They have also enjoyed some success in taking down many of the top members of Al-Qaeda. But the two most wanted men, Osama bin Laden and his right-hand man, Ayman al-Zawahiri, remain at large. At the moment, bin Laden is a kind of folk hero to a lot of Islamists, and uh, his ability to hit the United States in such a huge way and then elude capture, I think, gives a certain amount of, of hope and encouragement uh, to those radical groups. The U.S. is now sending troops and resources into some of the most forbidding terrain in the world to hunt for Bin Laden. They believe he's hiding in one of two places, along the mountainous Afghan-Pakistan border or in the extreme north of Afghanistan, a fearsome region called the Hindu Kush. When you think of the Hindu Kush, think of the Himalayas, think of the highest elements of the Rockies. There is no electricity up here. It's 14, 15, 16,000 feet snow. It's at least as difficult to operate there as it is anywhere in the world. The people that we're trying to deal with uh, don't put up much with outsiders coming in. The U.S. plan is based on the successful capture of Saddam Hussein in Iraq. After the fall of Baghdad, Saddam hid for months among loyal tribesmen near his hometown of Tikrit. He was taken down by a new group called Task Force 121. This time it was really done in the right way with the senior enough people making the decisions and with every different organization knowing that this had the sanction and blessing, if you will, of the president. Led by Rear Admiral William McRaven, a former Navy SEAL whose job is so secret there are no published photos of him. The task force included not only special forces and regular military troops, but CIA operatives as well, who collected and analyzed information. That force structure represented an unprecedented level of interagency cooperation. They began to lay out a visual map of relationships to determine which families were tied to Saddam, which clans were linked to him, who could possibly be helping him. And so within that, they begin developing a matrix and figure out who could be close, who could be far away. The strategy succeeded in December 2003, when a Saddam aide they had tracked down led them to his hiding place, a hole in the ground on a small farm south of Tikrit. I think the lessons learned in the hunt for Saddam Hussein are directly transferable to the hunt for Osama bin Laden, and capturing bin Laden is much more important than capturing Saddam Hussein. Although Admiral McRaven is still in charge, the task force hunting Osama bin Laden has been reconfigured for the challenge of working along the Afghan-Pakistan border. There are new experts in the area's languages and customs, for instance. The task force in Afghanistan includes special operations forces, both Army Green Berets and Navy SEALs. They are working with a contingent of CIA operatives. The military's focus tends to be tactics, you know, the, the nuts and bolts. Uh, the CIA's approach tends to be the design of what the car looks like when you put all the nuts and bolts together. So it's, it's marrying up those two capabilities. The key is to make sure the military can respond quickly to any new intelligence. What we're looking for is bringing the sensor 
the shooter loop closer and tighter. In other words, the person that finds the enemy is able to get to the people who take care of the enemy a lot sooner and a lot quicker. To help in their hunt, the commandos have the military's best equipment at their disposal. Unmanned aerial vehicles, such as Predators and Global Hawks, provide a constant view of the mountains. Special Ops also have their own aircraft to deliver them to the scene of a fight, quickly and with firepower if needed. We're really looking at things like the MH-53 Pavlo, the um, air refuelable um, helicopter that has a very large cargo capacity, can carry forces, can also be and is configured as a gunship with uh, sophisticated um, laser sights, computer guided sights. On the ground, new sensors buried under roads can count vehicles and measure their loads by the vibrations they emit, allowing the U.S. to detect unusual traffic. The operatives also carry the best possible equipment, from handheld GPS devices that can guide an airstrike on an enemy, to flip-down night vision goggles, to state-of-the-art radios. They're miniaturized, they're waterproof. They're uh, what we call bulletproof, and I don't mean by being shot, but you could drop them from a building, you could step on them, and they'll still function. The radios allow them to communicate within their teams and with higher-ups, even sending real-time video so the generals can see what their operatives are seeing. And the guys on the ground can talk directly to pilots overhead. This basically puts the special operations warrior in touch with not only his bosses, but all the capabilities the United States can bring to bear to assist him in his mission. But the commandos will need more than excellent equipment to work in this very primitive land. For one thing, the residents of this border region are notoriously hostile to outsiders. These areas are inhabited by people, the Pashtuns, who have lived there longer than any other human beings in the world today have lived on their turf. That means they kind of know their neighborhood. And when a bunch of foreigners come in to try to stir up trouble in their neighborhood, it almost never works out. There are very few similarities between trying to find Saddam Hussein in Iraq and trying to find Osama bin Laden in Afghanistan or Pakistan. For one thing, Saddam Hussein was hated by probably at least half the people in Iraq. Everybody reveres Osama bin Laden. He doesn't have any enemies. He is a guest. He is a Muslim. He will never in any way be given up. So special operations forces and regular army and marine troops are trying to convince the locals to help them by moving into villages and offering material aid and services. But they face serious skepticism. Not only are these tribes hostile to outsiders, many are still loyal to the Taliban, who never really disappeared. Many of them just, I think, went home. They took off their black turbans and put on white ones and, uh, and went home and melted into the population. But that means they're still there. U.S. forces have another problem. They can only operate in Afghanistan. But bin Laden and his fighters can move back and forth across the porous border with Pakistan. These people all belong to the same ethnic groups. They're cousins. These families go back thousands of years. For them, there is no difference between Afghanistan and Pakistan. The U.S. has pressured Pakistan to crack down on its tribal regions near the border. After hesitating, Pakistan's President General Pervez Musharraf finally agreed. It appeared to be a quid pro quo deal after Pakistan was caught selling nuclear secrets to, among others, Iran and North Korea. The U.S. imposed no sanctions. And in March 2004, Musharraf sent Pakistani troops where they had never been before. Pakistan, for the first time in its history since 1947, has gone into this tribal area. This is a no-go zone. This was always seen as off-limits. They encountered fierce resistance at a mud fortress in a town called Wana. The operation in Wana was just part of a hammer anvil operation with U.S. and Afghan forces on one side of the border and Pakistani troops sweeping first south and then swinging towards the border with approximately 5,000 entering the area around Wana. They killed upwards of 60 to 80 of these fighters. These are varsity level players that uh, have a lot of experience and captured somewhere between 120 and 130. The battle lasted two weeks. 
The Pakistanis believe some higher level operatives escaped over the border to Afghanistan through tunnels in the mountains. Even though Musharraf has sent his own troops into the border region, that's about as far as he's likely to go. I wouldn't expect that you'd see any large-scale U.S. military operation in Pakistan. He does have to answer to his population, which is Muslim. And for him to invite the United States or coalition forces, non-Muslims, to come in and hunt down Muslims and kill them, it would be so untenable that he would probably um, lose his position through a coup or some other, some other maneuver. With a new task force of special forces and CIA, helped by new technology and Pakistani troops on the other side of the border, the U.S. hopes it finally has the right combination to bring in bin Laden and Zawahiri. Whether that will stop al-Qaeda is open to debate. Finding these two men in particular, arresting these two men or killing these men, would have enormous importance. Symbolically, it's important. But I think, by and large, al-Qaeda now is bigger than bin Laden and Zawahiri. Coming up, the emergence of a new and deadlier al-Qaeda. Whatever the fate of Osama bin Laden and Ayman al-Zawahiri, the fact is that the once highly centralized al-Qaeda organization has spread like a cancer around the world. Jihad is now a worldwide threat. After three world wars, two hot, one cold, uh, in the 20th century, uh, we're now in a fourth one. The arrests or deaths of most of the top al-Qaeda leadership have made it clear that Osama bin Laden is no longer the general in charge of a global terrorist army with a base in Afghanistan. Instead, the organization has splintered into many different regional groups, all with their own agendas and leaders. Al-Qaeda is a multi-headed hydra. It is a world global phenomena that springs up like fire in different places at different times and has to be attacked on very many different levels. Al-Qaeda has spawned cells in at least 80 countries that the U.S. is aware of. The threat they pose is, if anything, even greater than at the time before 9-11. These are local, small, organic groups that were born for very local reasons, but slowly over time established closer ties to Al-Qaeda. Perhaps they had trained in Al-Qaeda camps, fought in Al-Qaeda wars, received money from Al-Qaeda. This is what I believe is the next generation of terror. What you might call Al-Qaeda 2.0. The decentralized network of regional terror cells now stretches from Western Europe and North Africa to the Pacific. It has its own leaders and game plan. Each of these different terrorist organizations are like the separate franchise teams. They have their own coaches, their own owners, their own objectives, their own players, their own immediate concerns, but they're all kind of following a set rule of play. I There are terrorist cells operating in North African regimes, from Morocco to Egypt. The despots who rule those countries brutally exterminated or exiled men they considered radical Muslims. Now many of the survivors are fighting back, driven by the teachings of Osama bin Laden and Al-Qaeda. And they have many sources of financing. The GSPC, Salafist Group for Preaching and Combat in Algeria, for instance, has a European network, an extensive network of North Africans that actually are engaging in credit card fraud, passport falsification, etc. They make a lot of money and they send some of it back to Algeria. In Indonesia, there is the Al-Qaeda-inspired extremist Islamic group, Jamaa Islamia. In October of 2002, they blew apart a nightclub in the Indonesian resort of Bali. The blast killed almost 200 people, mostly vacationers from Australia. The goal of the bombers was the overthrow of the Indonesian government and the establishment of a Muslim regime there and throughout Southeast Asia. Like Osama bin Laden and his followers in Al-Qaeda, Jamaa Islamiyah invokes its own brand of Islam to gain power. This is a political ideology that has captured a religion. The best analogies I can think of were Hitler and National Socialism 70 years ago, 
or Lenin and Bolshevism a hundred years ago. In Turkey, a regional terrorist group called the Great Eastern Islamic Raiders Front was reported to be working with Al-Qaeda recruits in November of 2003 when suicide truck bombers attacked two synagogues in Istanbul. Days later, bombs went off near the British consulate and a British-based bank. In all, 27 people were killed and almost 500 were injured. The operation showed signs of the deadly skills taught in bin Laden's training camps. They sent these people out to other nations to teach them how to structure their own units, how to gather information, how to use the internet, how to use technology against the West, how to acquire bombs and, and, and uh, devices that, that can uh, cause devastation. In Morocco, a group called Salafia Jihad was working to undermine the monarchy there, which has banned radical Islamic expression. Salafia Jihad was blamed for suicide bombing attacks in 2003 against five targets in Casablanca that included a Spanish restaurant and cultural center. But the death and destruction in Morocco turned out to be a mere prelude to what happened in Madrid on March 11, 2004. Terrorists planted 13 backpacks and gym bags stuffed with explosives in commuter trains entering three crowded stations. Detonators were wired to cell phones, and when they rang, the bombs went off. 197 people were killed, and more than 1,500 were injured. The Spanish government had at first blamed Basque separatists for the attacks. But it quickly became clear that responsibility belonged to a group claiming to be the representatives of Al-Qaeda in Europe called Ansar Al-Qaeda, or partisans of Al-Qaeda. Ansar Al-Qaeda was led by educated middle-class Muslim radicals who got their financial support in large part from ordinary criminals. The Spaniards have now discovered that some of the explosives used in the Madrid attack were purchased with drug money. One of the chief suspects in the bombings, a Tunisian businessman, enlisted a young Moroccan to smuggle hashish into Spain. The profits were used to buy guns and explosives. As Spain grieved its loss, the motive behind the bombings remained unclear. But the results were obvious. National elections held four days after the bombings led to the defeat of Spain's pro-American government and Spain's withdrawal of troops from Iraq. It's a success that surely bolstered terrorists around the world. Sixteen months after the Madrid bombings, Al-Qaeda strikes again, this time in London. Experts agree the July 7th London blasts have all the trademarks of Al-Qaeda. Like Madrid, the coordinated attack on the city's crowded transit system during rush hour was an attempt to wreak maximum chaos during a high-profile political event. The attack in London hit as the G8 summit opened in Scotland. Flanked by leaders of the world's largest industrial nations, British Prime Minister Tony Blair condemned the bombings. We condemn utterly these barbaric attacks. We send our profound condolences to the victims and their families. Today's bombings will not weaken in any way our resolve to uphold the most deeply held principles of our societies and to defeat those who would impose their fanaticism and extremism on all of us. The world leaders demonstrated a show of unity in the face of extremism. But the war on terror is not yet won. We should always remember that they are ahead of us. They know what they're going to do. They are in a new path already. And that's the game we are playing. It's a frightening scenario. One that poses a major and continuing challenge to the United States and its allies. All right, everybody. Abe Lincoln. Megan. He led us through the Civil War. Billy. Yo, his mom died when he was like nine. His wife.